Film is a magical art form. It can make you laugh, make you cry, and make you scream like almost nothing else can. This series is about films that make you do those things, sure, but it's mainly about films that make you say, What? Huh? Did they... Was that intentional? My name is Connor. I'm a filmmaker, educator, and connoisseur of terrible, terrible film. I'm here to be your guide to the realm of cinematic schadenfreude. It's Trash Your Peace Theater, the very best of bad movies. Secret Agent 00 Soul is a spy, action, horror, comedy thing released in 1990. It stars Billy D. Williams of Star Wars fame as Secret Agent James Brown III. It's ostensibly a spoof of James Bond films at the beginning, but it quickly unravels into something a little bit more than that. The tagline on the promotional artwork says, Never say what again. I'm not sure what this is supposed to mean in the first place, but it's also just plain wrong. The tagline should be more like, you will say what, and you will say it a lot. The film was directed and co-written by career stuntman Julius LaFleur. LaFleur has over 100 credits on IMDb as a stunt coordinator or performer, comprising a career spanning over 40 years. He performed as a stunt double in a bunch of notable films, including Ghostbusters, Police Academy, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, Die Hard, and probably most famous of all, Star Wars Episode VI Return of the Jedi where he was the body double for, you guessed it, Billy D. Williams, aka Lando Calrissian. If you were wondering how Lando Calrissian ended up in a film called Agent 00 Soul, well, there's your answer. Probably. I wanted to talk about this film first because I haven't really seen it talked about elsewhere. There's very little information on the internet about it, more on that later, and the only readily available copies are just cheap VHS transfers, which have degraded over several generations of tape. That's why all the video footage in this review is so grainy. However, this is a special, special film that needs to be talked about. Why? Well, let's dive in, shall we? I'm not just doing a bit, that's actually the director of the film. The story. You're gonna have to bear with me here for a moment because Secret Agent 00 Soul is difficult to talk about as a complete film, rather than as a series of scenes that happen. Why that is will become very clear soon. The film starts off in medias res with a lady secret agent chasing some guy. There's no storytelling to establish who these characters are or why we should care, but who gives a shit because look, gunshots! Look, a guy on fire! Oh, he's like really on fire. Look, multiple street filling explosions! Already you can see having a stuntman in the director's chair paying dividends. The lady agent calls in to report that the villain, Markov, got away. Markov got away. What? This guy is bad news because he's already apparently killed like six secret agents and he's on his way to America to kill our protagonist, secret agent James Brown III. <laughs> James Brown's introduction is the first of many confusing moments in the film and his introductory scene kind of serves as a microcosm of all the film's problems with writing and structure. There's a very basic rule of screenwriting that says, show, don't tell. When you think of action film characters like James Bond, or Indiana Jones, you usually have some kind of introductory sequence that gives you an idea of who the character is and what they do by showing you rather than just saying it. These sequences also help set the tone for the film right out of the gate. In Agent 00 Soul, rather than show what James Brown is doing, he explains in voiceover the details of a mission he just got back from. He had just returned to the United States after successfully completing a spy mission in Soviet Armenia. While on my mission, I was attacked and nearly shot down by a group of 20 Russian MiG fighter planes, or was it 15? What? Wouldn't it have been much more interesting to see that mission, rather than be told about it? You just showed a badass action scene with gunfighting, explosions, and a car chase. Why couldn't Billy D. Williams have been in that? That other point I had about tone? The opening scene of Double O Soul is played totally straight. There are no jokes. A dude gets set on fire, cars blow up, and people get shot. Follow that up with a sequence where Billy D. Williams falls out of a helicopter and it's played for laughs. Three minutes in and we're already getting tone whiplash. One more thing. He fell out of that helicopter and didn't even get hurt. You're such a real man. Trust me when I say this though, we're only getting started. By the way, if you were worried that you missed some of that 00 Soul theme song, but you're not because you will hear it several more times. So on his last mission, which we were just told about, apparently Billy D. Williams screwed up 
and blew up an aircraft carrier. So he goes back to the office expecting to get chewed out by his boss. Definitely not unreasonable. But he thinks to himself, maybe this is the day I quit and go into business for myself as a private detective. How do I know that, you might ask? Well, because he tells us. I had also explored the idea of going into business for myself. Somehow, in the back of my mind, I knew this was going to be the day I would finally quit and start my own private detective agency. So after Billy D. Williams quits, he decides to found his own private detective agency. Quickly, he discovers, however, that he's been cut off from using his secret agent resources and gadgets, and he has to fend for himself. He meets up with the 00 soul version of the Q character from James Bond, gets a ride from a racist caricature cab driver, and Markov tries to run him into traffic with a tow truck, prompting another screen filling explosion. Meanwhile, Alex, the agent from the opening scene, is on his tail trying to protect him from Markov. Then his giant son, James Brown IV, shows up and asks him for a job. They team up with Alex, and they start taking on cases as private detectives. Now I can almost hear what you're saying. You've just rattled off a bunch of random things. And that's what I mean when I say this film is difficult to summarize. The entire second act of the film becomes a series of what I can really only describe as episodes, only connected to each other by virtue of having the same characters in them. Each of these scenes can have an entirely different tone, structure, or even genre when compared to all of the other ones. There's no real spine or through line and no momentum carrying a plot forward except for the agents needing to capture Markov. But even then, the segments he appears in are usually only loosely related to the plot. James Brown is across the street. I know. Let's give him a good show. It almost feels like a Saturday morning cartoon series, where in each weekly episode, the villain is foiled, but he gets away while shaking his fist and saying, I'll get you, Billy D. Williams! So after a ton of these episodes happen, more detail on that later, finally the main characters decide that it's time to capture Markov. No, really, it just happens. It would be genius if I believed it was intentionally meant to be funny. That night, my daughter asked me if I could help her finally get rid of that pest Markov. So we waited in the lobby. Finally arrived. Give me some gold. Look, there's Markov! Where? Oh yeah, there's a plot twist where Alex is revealed to be uh, James Brown's daughter. Did I forget to mention that? They chase him into a hotel where, for no reason, Billy D. Williams decides not to kill him. I should have killed him then, but I just couldn't. Not like this. Anyway, somehow I knew I would have another opportunity very soon. Probably because he realized that the film was only an hour long. After Billy D lets Markov get away, he kidnaps Alex and holds her for ransom. Billy D Williams shows up to trade some ill-defined plans for Alex while wearing a Dracula cape for absolutely no reason. The exchange predictably doesn't go well. Markov shoots Billy D Williams and his son and daughter just kind of leave, but oh no, wait! He's not dead because the Q guy gave him an invisible bulletproof vest. What is it? An invisible bulletproof vest. Yes, seriously. The main characters chase Markov up onto a roof. Everyone acts completely nonplussed about Billy D. Williams still being alive. Markov gets away again in the dumbest way possible. Oh, I thought I got rid of you a couple of years ago, Markov. So if you're keeping store at home, that's the third false ending in a row. After that, the main characters all celebrate, even though Markov is still alive, by going to see an African pop band. Sure. They're all grooving to the music, but then, oh no, Markov shows up! And you're thinking to yourself, here we go. This is the real climax of the film. The music gets all eerie, and Markov's like right there behind him and he can't see him. For the first time, there's maybe some genuine tension, but oh, no, wait. Markov gets killed by a character we've never met off screen. 
And then the film ends. All right, let's talk about the characters. Number one, James Brown the Third, a.k.a. Agent 00 Soul. And yes, he is always introduced as Brown, comma, James Brown. You missed, uh, uh... Brown. James Brown. James Brown comes the closest to having a character with any kind of depth in the film. Everyone else is completely one-dimensional, but James Brown is different. He's got two dimensions. He's basically every secret agent trope rolled into one. He's suave, kicks all types of ass, wears a cape. Wait, what? The only other trait of note is that he hates his son. Like, uncomfortable hates him. It's never developed in any way other than expository dialogue, and it leads to some of the few moments in the film that are genuinely hard to watch. Uh, hey, Dad. Dad, it won't start. I bought I just bought a new battery. You're a nightmare. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I was thinking that my little boy, whom I worked so hard for, would someday take care of me. So I waited and waited. Hmm. This okra is the best I ever tasted. I am not going to give you $200. And you're going to have to go back to the mission and learn to change your situation yourself. You are a man! Like, for Christ's sake, let up. Billy D. Williams is a fine actor, but he has absolutely nothing to work with in this film, and his delivery is always the same. Whether he's talking about killing an international war criminal, or finding out that his love interest is his own daughter. Ben Douglas informed me that Alex Westmore was my daughter, and she was hired by British intelligence to kill Markov. More on that later. His delivery of the voiceover is also atrocious, but can you blame the guy? The script is just so awkward. Father on Earth that night. Got the plans back, a few drinks, party with my friends, Chief Rain, Cloud, and Bertha. Everything was beautiful. Number two, Alex Westmore, a.k.a. Ashley Brown. Alex Westmore is played by the director's wife, Amanda LaFleur, who also co-wrote the film and went on to have a career in stunt work herself. I will give the writers a gold star for one thing here. They did not make Alex a Bond girl type character who exists only to be Billy Dee's love interest. She can handle herself and she proves to be a far more effective secret agent than Billy Dee Williams is. She at least tries to kill Markov when he's right in front of her face. There's an incredibly awkward scene about halfway through the film where Alex is at James Brown's house. They're having dinner and wine, there's sensual music on and mood lighting, everything's just right for loving. And Billy Dee Williams muses in voiceover that Alex looks a lot like his old girlfriend. And a girl that looked very similar to my old girlfriend, Samantha. But despite that, he's all ready to sleep with her. Then, just in the nick of time, he gets a random phone call from a character we've never seen before, explaining that Alex is actually his daughter. Samantha Rogers. How do you know that name? That's your mother. I know that. That makes me your father. What? You look just like your mother. Whoops! But you're real name is Ashley. If I can remember correctly, you have a birthmark on your buttocks. That was, that was close. Number three, James Brown the fourth, AKA Junior. This character is the most egregious example of the film's issues with show don't tell. The way we're introduced to him is admittedly unique across films I've watched. His character introduction is a rap number. I'm James Brown the third. They call me Junior. But the fact is I'm still growing. Junior's character traits are the following. He's fat. He's hungry. Some vittles you got here? You want my food? Uh, yeah. He's a coward. I'm a lookout. Lookouts don't go inside. Billy D. Williams can't stand him. Uh, I forgot to put film in the camera. You idiot! That's about it. Number four, Markov. Markov has no character. He's the most generic villain possible, and he only exists as a poorly defined motive for the plot. He also has the worst Russian accent ever in cinematic history. I shoot at him, doesn't work. I hit him with car, doesn't work. And this, perfect plan. Number five, Fats Williams. He's like the mother. I don't know his character's name because as far as I can tell, he doesn't have one. He's listed on IMDb as diner owner, and I can't find him in the credits. Seriously, I've looked a dozen times. If you can find him in there, let me know so I can get my head checked. He exists in the film only to do two things, rent an office to Billy D. Williams, and say incomprehensible dialogue. Just 
get away and drive is gonna hurt somebody. Bertha! Brother, who's that girl? She's gorgeous. Don't worry about it. I got it sewed up for the night. Number six. Intelligence. Intelligence here. Intelligence here. Go ahead, 27. <coughs> Intelligence here. Episodes. So as I said before, the bulk of the film is made up of what I'm going to call episodes. They don't logically form any kind of plot structure, they don't build on each other, and there's no solid through line to hang any of the story elements on. So the film is essentially just a series of things that happen one after the other. I'm going to briefly describe some of these episodes for you now. I'm not going to explain each one in detail because one, that would take forever. And two, that would ruin the fun of seeing the film for yourself. So this will not be a detailed breakdown of each scene in the film. Except for one. We'll get to that. Number one, infidelity case. Some guy pays Billy D. Williams $2,000 to find out if his wife is cheating on him. Billy D. changes into a comical detective outfit and takes his son and his new secret agent friend to find out what's going on. Turns out that Markov actually set up the case so that he could kill Billy D. Williams, but... Junior forgot to put film in the camera. Do it! So the heroes get out of the car seconds before it is riddled with bullets and explodes. Boy, this neighborhood has really changed. Number two robbery scene. Two guys who can't speak English try to rob the diner. Billy D stops them with a coffee cup. The whole scene lasts 30 seconds. Number three, drug dealers. Someone comes in with a tip that some bad dudes are dealing drugs out of a house. Billy D. Williams and crew attempt to sting by dressing up as members of a church selling sweet potato pie for some reason. Junior wears drag for no reason. Then Junior incapacitates the entire crew by farting. Number four, social security thief. Well, anyway, someone has been stealing our social security checks. Some guy is stealing social security checks from old ladies. Billy D tracks him down, then he gets punched down a flight of stairs. <coughs> then he gets thrown out a window. Do you see a pattern forming here? No. That's because there isn't one. Every single segment changes up the tone and story of the film. And only one of these could really be said to be related to the main plot of killing Markov. So that's the story of the film, I guess. Except for one bit. I'm getting there. So let's talk about technical stuff. So now that we've discussed some of the story elements in the film, Let's talk about technical things. When it comes to Double O Soul, there's not a lot to talk about in this area. Unlike a lot of bad films that have lackluster camera work, bad lighting, terrible audio, etc., Secret Agent Double O Soul is honestly fairly competently made from a technical standpoint. The cinematography is nothing to look at, but it's not terrible. All the action is framed well, and the lighting is serviceable. The audio is all generally pretty good, and the music is amazing in that cheesy late 80s sort of way. I mean that theme song, my goodness. So really, what is there to discuss? Well, two areas stick out to me. One, the stunts and effects. And two, the editing. The best single element about the film from a technical execution perspective is the stunt work and the practical effects. It's clear that Julius LaFleur knows his stuff about stunts and how to direct them. I think the only issue with this area of the film is that the first act has most of the stunt work in it. After the shootout with Alex and Markov, it kind of tapers off from there. But what's in there is good and clearly done practically. Well done, LaFleur. Okay, so number two, editing, here we go. So we've got this bad movie, right? Bad acting, terrible script, bad jokes, weird tone, etc. But what really takes Secret Agent 00 Soul to the next level is the bizarre and spastic editing style. It's what ultimately makes the film so engaging and wonderful instead of just bad. There's a general guideline in film editing that states, get in late and get out early. Basically, you want to show the parts of your scene that advance the plot and pretty much nothing else. A good example is, who cares that a character drove their car to reach their destination unless there's some plot relevance to it? Just cut to them being there, we don't care. Double O Soul takes this guideline to an absurd degree. 
It feels like this film can't wait to move on to the next scene, the next thing. Take the diner robbery scene. It has no purpose in the plot at all. It's just two men shows up, James Brown defeats them, and the scene ends. The most extreme example of this is this scene. I don't even know if I can call it a scene. It's like 10 seconds long. The scene is the characters have a bomb. We don't know how they have it. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. There's a line about being careful with the bomb, and then the bomb explodes. Cut to characters all sitting around with cartoonish looking soot on their faces. I've slowed down the footage and it looks a little weird, but that's because I have to do that to have space to talk over this scene. Here it is in real time. Bomb? There ain't no bomb in this briefcase. Just don't open that. Back to business. It's like the editor couldn't wait to get this scene over with. So I've already kind of talked about the film's structural editing being a complete mess. That's honestly most of what makes it charming, but still. Scenes are thrown at the wall in random order with no regard for following any sort of clear, coherent plotline. What saves the film is that the breakneck pace means you don't have time to get bored, and the scenes themselves are so ridiculous that it almost doesn't matter. Look at this clip, for instance. I haven't shown or talked about this clip yet. Can you guess what part of the film it comes from? It's hard when nothing fits together in any kind of order. You could literally rearrange the middle 40 minutes of this film in any order, and virtually nothing would change. Things just happen, and nothing is more demonstrative of this quality than the haunted house scene. What? There's a haunted house scene in this film? Well, yes, this spy action comedy has a haunted house segment. I've been wanting to talk about it because it's easily my favorite thing about the entire film. Alright, so check it out. Some guy comes into Fats Williams' diner and complains about ghosts in his house. The evil spirits are something in my house. So Fats Williams suggests that he hire James Brown to go check out the house and find out what's going on. Immediately, the film turns into a Scooby-Doo episode for 10 minutes. Junior is a coward, so he refuses to go inside the haunted house. However, he gets scared by what is either a child or a little person wearing a mummy costume. You know we're in for a wild time now. The trio enters the house and Billy D. Williams explains that he has precognition. Somehow I knew it would happen that way. Nah, I'm just playing, but he does this a whole bunch of times. Of course the door closes by itself. Once inside, they're greeted by a hilariously generic creepy butler with a giant knife, played by the film's assistant director. Then Billy D. Williams drops the greatest voiceover non secular joke of all time. Business was definitely getting better. I have become somewhat of a local hero in the area. Even the butler knew who I was. Next, they run into a werewolf! What the hell is that? He looks so awful. Now this is some good stuff. When they see the werewolf, no one acts scared or repulsed in any way. They just treat it like it's part of a haunted house ride at Universal or something. But later, when they come back from upstairs, they see the werewolf and everyone screams! Like, why didn't that happen the first time? What do they see upstairs, you might ask? Well... You see, that's really the core of this whole scene. Upstairs, are you ready? They are greeted by rapping mummies. Yes! 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 So the mummies rap at them and start doing this kick-ass dance number. Meanwhile, the three heroes are just terrified looking at it. It's the highlight of the film for me, honestly. Just look at it. Oh, also, that lead mummy is Billy D. Williams' son. I'd say he does a fine job of rapping. What did you say? Oh my god. Finally, the heroes run away and they end up in the basement where they discover that a group of random dudes are trying to scare the old guy from the diner into selling the house. As explained by Billy D. Williams in another voiceover. As it turned out, the butler was a real estate agent. I was trying to scare Mr. Powers out of his home so that they could buy it and build a rib joint. End of assignment. That's it. This never comes up again and was entirely self-contained. See you next week for another exciting episode of Secret Agent 00 Soul. So what have we got?
It looks to me like you have a few talented stunt people who set out to make their own movie. They had Billy D. Williams for a weekend, some junk cars to blow up, and access to a community theater's costume closet. Did they succeed at making a coherent film? No. Is it a good spy parody or even a good comedy? Not really, but it absolutely succeeds at being an entertaining film. I said at the beginning of the video that I wanted to cover this film because of how little discussion I could find about it online. There's really nothing significant to speak of. Searches for Secret Agent 00 Soul will really only yield three things. One, the IMDb page for this film. Two, news items from 1999 about a film project with the same title with Chris Tucker that never got produced. And three, the 1964 hit song Agent 00 Soul by Edwin Starr, which is a pretty great song, so no complaints there. IMDb page for this film is similarly pretty barren. There's a complete cast and crew list which probably was sourced from the credits, but no real background information, no behind the scenes info, not even a budget, which I'm really curious about. The film only has 4 reviews and 113 total ratings, so there's barely traffic to this page to begin with. And the most recent review is from 2005. The only images on the page are this poster and 3 mysterious selfies of an older woman who may have added them to the page by mistake. The whole thing really adds to the mystery and charm of the film. I would love to see behind the scenes footage from this shoot. I want to know if the cast and crew were in on the joke, so to speak, if they knew that what they were making was ridiculous. I also want to know, although I suspect this must be the case, whether the film's husband and wife writing team were just making this up as they went along, shooting random scenes when they had time and or money, and then putting them all together later to try and make a film out of it. Would certainly explain a lot of things. I love this movie. I think it should be seen by everyone, but especially those with an appreciation for laughably bad cinema. I feel like I'm half laughing with the film and half laughing at it. This is a phenomenal film to watch with friends, especially with a few drinks. It's one of my favorite bad movies of all time, and I want more people to see it. I hope this review has convinced you that it's worth a watch. Heck, the film's only 70 minutes long. Go and watch Secret Agent 00 Soul. I believe it's up on YouTube somewhere right now. It's baffling, charming, hilarious, and altogether it's just really ridiculously fun. I found an interview with Julius LaFleur on a Star Wars fan site where he talks about some of his stunt work. In the interview, he discusses how he held the world record for a high fall and some of his crazy stunts like a 98 foot drop through a window at the beginning of the film Night Shift. On Return of the Jedi, LaFleur played multiple parts including scout troopers, the skiff pilot at Jabba's palace, and most famously, the dude who jumps head first into the Sarlacc pit. When he's asked about why he was the one to do that, his answer is simple. Nobody else was willing to do it. He was the only one who took the risk. I respect that to a certain degree. For better or for worse, LaFleur is a guy who is willing to take risks and do what is needed to get the job done. It's silly, I realize, to wax poetic about an incoherent, failed spy comedy from the 90s that virtually no one has even heard of. But that's part of what makes films like this special. He took a risk and he made something. He completed it. He made a film. How many people can say that? The result is Secret Agent 00 Soul. Check it out! Thank you so much for watching, and be on the lookout soon for more content like this. If you liked the video, hated the video, leave a suggestion below and let's start a discussion. Thanks!